mass, inducible mass, and endothelial mass, or NOS3. There are three genes that reside in three different chromosomes to make these enzymes. There's a lot of homology between them, about 50 or 60 percent. Uh, and they're very complicated enzymes. <coughs> and they're very ubiquitous. Not only is the brain type found in the brain, but it's found in the uterus. It's found all over the place. And the same is true with the inducible isoform. Most of the time, you don't see the inducible isoform in tissues. It's not there. The transcript is not there, the protein is not there, and the activity is not there. In order to see it, you have to expose the tissues themselves to pro-inflammatory cytokines. IL-1, interferon gamma, TNF-alpha, etc. When you do that, you stimulate the transcription factors to make NOS2. So if you see NOS2, transcripts or protein, that's a biomarker for inflammation, whether it's atherosclerosis, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, myocarditis, colitis, nephritis, arthritis, doesn't matter. The pathways are the same. NOS3 is also found in a wide number of tissues. It's found in the pancreas and the islets. Probably participates in insulin secretion, as does NOS1. It turned out that these enzymes were popping up all over the place to make nitric oxide. What they do is they convert an amino acid, L-arginine, which is an essential amino acid in our diet. There's some substances like vitamins and some of the amino acids where the body doesn't make enough. You have to have them in your diet. L-arginine is one of those substances. The terminal guanidino nitrogen of L-arginine is oxidized to form an intermediate hydroxyarginine. And this is then converted to citrulline and nitric oxide. That's how it's made. The enzyme has a complicated array of cofactors that regulate the activity of the enzyme. That's very common in biochemistry. The cofactors are things, things like heme as a prosthetic group, um, calmodulin, calcium, biopterin, NADPH, oxygen. It's a complicated set of biochemistry. But this excited me because when enzymes have complexity with so many regulatory mechanisms, it allows the biochemists and the pharmacologists a variety of ways to regulate their activity. And there are a variety of ways. And some of them have become very important. I'll tell you why shortly. For example, if you have a deficiency of tetrahydrobiopterin, the enzyme no longer makes nitric oxide. It makes another free radical, superoxide anion, which is also very reactive. And that will combine with nitric oxide to make a toxic species called peroxynitrite. And that's what happens with inflammation. You induce the production of NO, superoxide, you make a lot of peroxynitrite. And I'll show you shortly, you have a lot of proteins that get modified because of that. So let me try to put this together now so it makes some sense for you. <coughs> there are a variety of hormones or first messengers that regulate the availability of these cofactors that are required for nitric oxide synthase to convert arginine to nitric oxide. Now this has led me and others to think about nutritional supplementation. I have helped several companies develop some nutritional products with L-arginine and antioxidants uh, for cardiovascular disease, other diseases. And they're becoming more and more popular, but we also need more research to prove that they're working properly as we think they are. There are some good indications with animal studies, but the clinical studies are rather mixed at the moment. And I think it's because the clinical studies probably were not done properly, is my opinion. But when you make the nitric oxide, it activates the soluble isoform of guanylacyclase to make cyclic GMP. This activates a cyclic GMP-dependent protein kinase, which phosphorylates a variety of proteins 
and you then get a biological, physiological effect. That's the pathway. However, as pathways often go, they're more complicated. While nitric oxide really prefers to make cyclic GMP go up, there are other pathways competing for the nitric oxide. It can be oxidized to nitrite or nitrate. It can form complexes with other transition metals besides iron in the heme prosthetic group of these proteins. It can form nitrosation reactions with thiol groups and proteins. There are more than 100 proteins that get nitrosated on their cysteine thiols. That may turn out to be a very important signaling pathway. Some of the receptors, some of the transcription factors, some of the proteases are probably regulated that way. But a very important reaction is this interaction of nitric oxide with superoxide anion to make peroxynitrite. What peroxynitrite will do is interact with DNA, RNA, and a variety of proteins to nitrate them and oxidize them. And they will form nitrotyrosine residues in the proteins. Very common, and when that happens, often the enzyme activity is inhibited. We have found many proteins in the mitochondria of diabetic animals. We think some of the problems with diabetes may be related to this. And for some time, I was hoping this reaction would be reversible. So we spent some time looking for the enzyme that took the nitrate off the tyrosine. But it's been a tough research project. It's not been easy. Um, but there may be other approaches too. For example, if we figured out how to regulate peroxynitrite production and the nitration of some of these proteins, we could come up with a whole new category of anti-inflammatory agents. Wouldn't it be nice to have anti-inflammatory besides steroids and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories? I think it's possible, but it's going to take a lot more research to do that. I think it might happen. Okay, let me try to put this together in terms of some physiology and relevance for you. <clears throat> there are a number of diseases where the endothelium of the blood vessels do not make enough nitric oxide. We call this endothelial dysfunction. You find it in patients with hypertension, diabetes, atherosclerosis, probably obesity, tobacco use. Their blood vessels do not make adequate concentrations of nitric oxide. Therefore, their blood vessels are vasoconstricted. You don't have adequate nutrition and blood flow and oxygen to the tissues. You have enhanced, enhanced atherosclerosis. And why is that? Well, it's because these diseases are associated with the production of reactive oxygen species, other free radicals, like superoxide, that diminish the production of nitric oxide. These diseases are also associated with metabolite of arginine that's an inhibitor of the nitric oxide synthase called asymmetric dimethylarginine. So by understanding the precise biochemistry, maybe we can come along with nice, important supplements for therapy for these diseases. And I believe that's going to be the case. That's why I've become interested in nutritional supplements and antioxidants. You know, maybe we can improve diabetic therapy or hypertension therapy or statin therapy. Turns out the statins not only work by altering LDL, they also work by enhancing nitric oxide production. Most people don't know that. And they have dual effects in blood vessels. All right, now let's, this is a partial list. I call this my David Letterman list. I don't know if you watch David Letterman. <laughs> And he's always got his top ten things. Well, Murad has a group, but it's not top ten, it's more than that. <clears throat> these are things that I try to follow. I don't work in all these areas. I can only do so much. But there are a number of problems and diseases where nitric oxide participates. We know that nitric oxide is a neurotransmitter in the brain and peripheral tissues. I told you about the blood vessels in the corpus cavernosus. It's important in the GI tract, other places. The neurotransmitter coming out of the nerves is nitric oxide. If you take a mouse and knock out mouse one 
and now induce an infarct. The infarct is smaller. The brain infarct, stroke. If you knock out NOS3 and induce a stroke, it's bigger. If you do a double knockout of NOS1 and NOS3, the mice have lost their memory. You put them in a tank of water with a float, they can't find the float anymore. So there's a role in memory. So the, there are models where we can pursue some of these things. <laughs> the brain is always very complicated to work with because of the heterogeneity of the cell types and, and we need more models in that system. <coughs> um, pulmonary hypertension is one that is interesting. You saw it in the video. In utero, the fetus does not need to perfuse the lung to get oxygen. What it does is it perfuses the placenta, <coughs> and the oxygenated blood from the mother exchanges oxygen with the fetal hemoglobin to oxygenate the fetus. When a baby is born prematurely, one or two kilos, the lungs are not very well developed, the blood vessels in the lungs are very constricted, we call it pulmonary hypertension. These are blue babies. They're hypoxic. They shut blood right to left through the patent frame and the ductus, arteriosus. Uh, and they don't do very well, obviously. Another group in Boston, one of my colleagues, found that if you put nitric oxide in the nasal catheter at low concentrations, along with oxygen and along with some surfactant, the babies do much, much better. They stop shunting, the hypoxia improves. So it's been very valuable in the pediatric neonatal units, intensive care units. And a lot of it's being used now all over the world. And it's been available now for probably 15 years or more. Uh, it's a very promising approach. Platelet aggregation. We know that both cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP inhibit the aggregation of platelets. They're probably both equally important. Nitric oxide inhibits the aggregation of platelets. Why do you want to do that? Well, because atherosclerotic plaques often have platelet aggregates sitting on the top of what we call a volcano. <laughs> I mean, here's this thing that's going to blow up and erupt. The plaque 